All rise. The Court of Appeals, Division I, is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. We are here for oral argument in cause number CV 210501, Vintage Speedsters of California versus Vintage Motor Car Limited. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded as well as live stream, so I ask counsel please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes to present their argument. Appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal should you choose. We have read the briefs. We have conferenced this case. We're familiar with the facts. Please take that into consideration during your presentation. At this point, counsel, you may proceed. Good morning. I'm Janae Perry Meyer, attorney for the appellant in this action, Vintage Motor Car Limited. Uh, I do want to reserve some time at the end for any questions or rebuttal, so I'm going to aim to keep this short. As you know, the case turns on whether a contract referred to as the body contract between the old manufacturer, Peregrine Industries, and the buyer, the appellant, remained in full force and effect after the buyer ceased making royalty payments to the appellee, the seller. Um, in the briefs before you, it's undisputed that the old manufacturer went out of business. However, in the motion for summary judgment, the seller's motion for summary judgment that the trial court granted, the seller had originally argued the old manufacturer was still in business and that a man named Greg Leach had simply taken over operations as its day-to-day -day manager. Uh, in that motion, they also argued that the leech had knowledge of the body contract and its terms and that the body contract was still being performed by the old manufacturer. Um, the seller at the time was relying on some declarations of its counsel or that its counsel had drafted for Greg Leach to sign. Um, and ultimately Leach did sign those declarations but the buyer believed some of the facts in them to be untrue. Um, so the buyer having already testified that it does no business with the old manufacturer and has a new agreement with Leach's corporation. Uh, the buyer had also disclosed invoices with Leach's corporation as evidence of this new agreement. Um, the buyer moved for Rule 56D relief, which was ultimately granted over the seller's objections to depose Leach. Um, and at his deposition, Leach stated he must have misunderstood or misread the declarations and corrected many statements in them. Um, he testified, the old manufacturer was out of business. He didn't assume the operations and was not their manager. He was not legally affiliated with them in any way. They did not sell or assign him any contracts and he had no knowledge of any of the contracts, clients or business operations. It was only so he didn't, he didn't assume whether it was assigned or not. He, he did or didn't assume performance of, of, of that contract. No, he testified that they didn't sell or assign him anything. He had no knowledge of even their client base, how they ran their operations, zero knowledge of the old manufacturer's practices uh, or their contracts. And that was all before the trial court? That was all before the trial court. And the seller acknowledged in a notice of errata that they filed, it's uh, index of record 69, and then again in index of record 93, they acknowledged that the declarations and the testimony are inconsistent and that the deposition testimony corrects statements in the declarations, which are the statements the seller relied on in their initial motion for summary judgment. Um, the buyer also highlighted these inconsistencies for the court and said the deposition testimony is clearly correcting these statements from the declarations and both parties acknowledged that 
they weren't consistent, but in finding a fact 15, the trial court said the declarations and the deposition testimony were consistent, such that there were no material conflicts between the two, which I thought was incredible because we'd both acknowledged that they were inconsistent and highlighted for the court where there were material conflicts. Um, so let me figure out where I was here, sorry. After conceding that those facts that the seller relied on in the motion were incorrect, the seller raised a new argument in response to the buyer's cross motion for summary judgment and in its own reply to its motion for summary judgment, stating that the new manufacturer simply assumed operations from the old manufacturer. But that's also clearly erroneous because the deposition testimony states he didn't assume their operations and had no knowledge of their operations. He just described the way he does business. He merely leases the same plant that they leased, the same manufacturing building. What happened to the, the mold attack issue? The mold issue? Um, so there the seller's arguing that exclusivity in the body contract is limited to the exclusive right to production off of the buyer's molds. And the buyer argues it means the exclusive right to anything resembling a speedster. Um, the molds themselves are down in Mexico at that plant, and the buyer elected not to move them. If it could have a new manufacturer use the same molds and not have to transport them to another manufacturer's facility. Um, so if we just talk about what's actually going on, your client entered into the body contract. The body contract says there are two molds used for making speedsters. Your client, did, was there any interruption in their production off those two molds? Do you have any evidence that somebody else was receiving bodies made off those molds? That's what, what did they lose by Peregrine no longer being in business. That's what it's difficult for me to understand. Sure, yeah. What what has changed is they had exclusivity from Peregrine that Peregrine wasn't producing speedster bodies for anyone else. So now their competitors worldwide are receiving speedster bodies, not produced off of their molds, but produced off of Greg Leach's molds from that same facility. So where the buyer had basically the exclusive right to any speedster bodies before, now anybody can go and buy the speedster bodies there. If we back that up a bit, let me make sure I understand. Your client is not alleging that the molds that they purchased or the exclusive right to use the molds under the body contract are being used to produce speedster bodies for other people. Their claim is that Mr. Leach is using different molds to produce speedster bodies. Correct. It's not about the molds. It's about the speedster bodies themselves. He didn't have to worry about different competitors in the market having access to these molds before with Peregrine on the same deal he had with pricing and delivery and quality. But now, with his new arrangement with the new manufacturer, it's completely different. He pays 25% more per body. He said quality has declined. Uh, delivery occurs whenever his direct competitor, the new manufacturer, says it's going to occur. It could be two, four weeks. It's all different than the terms he had with the old manufacturer. And on top of it, the new manufacturer sells in the open market. Okay. Let's back it up because I, I want to make sure I get the point. Let's talk about simply exclusivity. Yeah. The body contract said your client is purchasing the right to molds made by, or the right to bodies made by two specific molds. Are you contending that those two specific molds are being used to furnish bodies to people other than your client? No. Okay. So that moves on to there's a difference in delivery, et cetera, quality. Well, not exactly. So okay. the argument is that the exclusive right was to anything resembling a speedster produced out of that from Peregrine, basically. So it's not only just off of their molds, it's that they're not going to produce their own molds, Peregrine wouldn't, um, and then go and sell on the open market so that 
the buyer would have competition from other people buying Speedster bodies. What would what preclude the... Leach from making a mold? Let's say Peregrine's still in business. Your two molds are still with Peregrine, and Leach starts another business competing with Peregrine and makes the same thing that he's making right now. How is that different? He had that existing manufacturing business before he moved into Peregrine's location. So I, there's nothing that would preclude him from doing that because he's not legally affiliated with Peregrine in any way. He's not bound by the exclusivity term of that contract. They entered into a whole new agreement together on completely different terms. He simply is providing manufacturing just like another manufacturer would. Go ahead. What are the specific contractual terms that you think have been violated then? So exclusivity, which we just talked about, because I mean, the, what is the ex not just exclusivity? Don't don't say a, a word, but tell me exactly what term and how that reads, and what is the violation of that term? Sure, the term is Peregrine will not produce anything resembling a speedster for any other party. Essentially, um, I'm paraphrasing there, but the, those are the words: anything resembling a speedster for anyone and else. Peregrine. Is the Specific old manufacturer is the one that says that it cannot do it. Okay. Right. Peregrine was the party to the contract mm -hmm. with the buyer. So, and there's no assignment of that contract to the other party. So he's not Leach and his company are not in privity with the buyer under the body contract. So that term as to exclusivity would have been violated. Let's say the contract was assumed or assigned, which it wasn't. Then the violation would be, now there's no exclusivity, we're selling to everybody worldwide, which we weren't before, you know, that was only being produced for the other guy. So that term, and then... But, I'm sorry, so is, but you, maybe I misheard you. It sounded to me like you said, but Leach isn't in privity, so what they, he does doesn't violate the contract. Well, sure, the new manufacturer can't be in breach of a body contract that he wasn't assigned or didn't assume. He's not in privity of contract. Okay. I just same, want to make sure that's, what, that's yeah. what I heard you said. So what is the violation then? You've told me what, what doesn't violate the contract. What, what does violate the contract? Well, the body contract itself just isn't in effect at all. So I, I was saying, I thought you were asking me, uh, for, for argument's sake, had the contract been assigned, what would the violations be and what are the specific terms? But given that the contract was never assigned or assumed by anyone and the new manufacturer had no knowledge of it, um, it it's just not in effect at all. There's no one performing under it. Where in the so the, the violation then is the lack of performance? It's, well, yeah, the, the contract itself is not being performed by any party because the the other party to that contract went out of business nobody was assigned or assumed it or knew of its terms so it just kind of went by the wayside so no one is producing molds under the contract I mean, I mean, Correct. no a... one's producing molds under that contract that contract ceases to be in effect since the old manufacturer went out of business where in the record is there evidence that Leach is making bodies that resemble a speedster? Uh, it's in his deposition testimony, and I can find where in the record it is for you. And do that on rebuttal if you'll, if you'll point me to it, because I did not see that. But you agree with me that the record supports the fact that he's not using the speedster molds to produce bodies for any other customer. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I do want to point out on those molds, finding a fact number 13, it was undisputed by the parties that the buyer purchased its molds and ownership was transferred to the buyer, but the court found the buyer didn't purchase the molds and the molds were not transferred to the buyer. So that finding a fact is clearly erroneous on that point. Um, and then I think we've touched on most of the other ones. I did want to touch on finding a fact number eight. Uh, the court there had attributed some testimony of Leach to my client, the buyer, saying the buyer testified that the new manufacturer is performing exactly the same, if not better. 
Um, that was not the buyer's testimony. It was taken out of context from some of Leach's testimony. And I, the court kind of got it wrong there and thought it was the buyer saying that. But in contrast, the buyer had testified as to the difference uh, in quality, pricing, and delivery in his testimony. Let's talk about that. Sure. Pricing, service, and delivery. The terms set forth in that contract don't quantify any of that, do they? They don't. They say they're to remain the same as the day that it was executed. Um, and so the buyer did produce evidence of what he was paying before, and he did testify that with his new manufacturer, he has to pay 25% more, and that delivery is different and the quality has declined. But given we've got that testimony. Sure. But given the fact that market fluctuations, we've got supply chain issues, we've got all kinds of issues, when it's remained the same, did they mean, and that's the problem, the contract doesn't say exactly what that means. Sure. Remain the same, that you'll pay the market price. How are we supposed to quantify what remain the same means given the current market conditions and the fact that it's not defined? Sure, and, and maybe that would have been an issue between the old manufacturer and the buyer, but we'll never know since they went out of business. And the buyer could have raised something if, let's say, the old manufacturer came to them and say, hey, I can't do this flat fee for each of these bodies anymore. I can't charge you four grand per body. I have to charge you more because of market changes in costs. There's no evidence to that effect that any of that occurred because the body contract wasn't being performed or in effect. So sure, that could have been something negotiated between the parties to the body contract had the old manufacturer needed to come to them and ask for a change. Um, but that's not what happened here. And there's no evidence about market changes to the body contract terms. The only testimony that was put forth about market costs or changes was general testimony of the new manufacturer with respect to his business experience or his experience in the market. It had nothing to do with the specific terms of that contract. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna reserve some time for rebuttal. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. All right. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Jason Bruno here on behalf of the appellee, Vintage Speedsters of California. Uh, to start off with, you know, I'll be happy to address any direct questions that the court has if I could assist in resolving any issues. Uh, but I would like to start by saying that I don't think the court is going to find support in the record for the arguments that were made uh, here today by uh, Ms. Perry Meyer. I think the court pointed out a couple times where it didn't seem that, that, that the citations to the record or evidence supporting those arguments could be found in the record and, and Judge Campagnolo reached the same conclusion. Um, the court asked a good question which was not answered, which was what was lost as a result of the alleged failure of the body contract and the answer is nothing. There was no evidence submitted in the record below, nor did you hear any, any argument of that evidence from Ms. Perry Meyer today before you of how the appellant has been harmed by this alleged failure of the body contract. It didn't. And, and counsel didn't talk about the testimony of her own client where he admitted all these things as the gentleman was sitting there telling to me, well, the body contract is no longer in force and effect. He then tells me, well, we're actually waiting for delivery for a couple bodies. And then he testified about how he plans to use Mr. Leach going forward in the future. They're gonna use the same molds that are located in the same plant to make their own bodies going forward in the future. Mr. Tiering testified that that was his plan to do so, and Mr. Leach confirmed that I will continue fulfilling orders. And as Judge Campagnolo correctly found, the body contract has remained in full force and effect, and the service actually is better now than it was under the time my clients, the Duncans or vintage well, speedsters, uh, had the contract. Well, because I'm confused because your colleague just said that, that the contract is essentially dead, that nothing's, nothing is occurring under, under that contract. Yeah, and, and I don't think there's any evidence that, that was dead. The same thing is happening. What's happening is 
is Mr. Tierink now is calling up and ordering bodies to be produced from the molds that are located in Mexico in Mexico in the old Peregrine facilities, which Mr. Leach has now taken over. Everything is the same. The only difference is instead of contacting the gentleman who used to operate and own Paragon, Mr. Tierink now calls up and contacts Mr. Leach. And are they, are they using the the uh, bodies that are, the, the molds that are specified in the contract. Exactly. Yes, they are. And, and don't take my word for it. Here is Mr. Leach's testimony, which is quoted on page 12 of my brief. So the ones that were not your molds before you took over, those still exist and, and are at Peregrine. And the answer was, yes, they are. And the question was, are they currently being used? And Mr. Leach's answer was, yes, they're being used for your defendant's product. And then Mr. Tiering confirmed the same thing. The same molds that they got pursuant to the contract um, are at the same facility, and they're still being used solely to manufacture bodies for Mr. Tiering. There is absolutely no difference. Ms. Perry Meyer inferred that there were changes in the terms of the prices or delivery, but there weren't any evidence of that. But the court raises a good point, which is, well, obviously the delivery and the prices were going to fluctuate due to inflation and other matters. That was going to be the same whether or not they took over or my clients still operated the, the facility or the plant. So there were certainly no damages, but there also wasn't the issue addressed of waiver. Judge Campagnolo found that, well, even if even if your arguments about the body contract were true, you waive that ability because what's the first thing they should have done here? Mr. Tiering should have contacted Mr. Leach or Mr. Peregrine and said, hey, wait a minute, buddy. We have this agreement where you're supposed to, where you're supposed to do the same thing and you're not supposed to manufacture for anybody else or any other complaints they have. They didn't do that. In fact, Mr. Tiering admits he never complained about the terms of the body contract. He never declared it in default. He never did anything. And in fact, he said, well, we're actually getting a little bit better deal than we were getting before Mr. Leach took over the operations. So there's a waiver issue there. And is Mr. Leach, is he developing and using his, his own mold for, for other clients? Uh, I don't believe so, but I also don't think that's relevant because Mr. Leach was doing that beforehand anyway, so there was no difference. So the, the body contract says Peregrine can't design other molds for anybody else, and, they, and it was undisputed, and I don't think uh, even appellant would contest that, that Peregrine isn't certainly competing. Uh, or making molds either from those bodies or any of the others, and Judge Campagnolo found that as a result there was no breach there. But there still needs to be a waiver argument. I'm going to have this gentleman sitting here telling me, well, this body contract's not, full, not in full force and in effect, and I don't have to pay your clients, but I'm awaiting for delivery from those same molds that, that your clients gave to me, and I plan on continuing to do so in the foreseeable future. In fact, he told me it would be foolish for him not to. So uh, we think Judge Campagnolo's uh, uh, findings should be affirmed in all respect. And, and the body contract wasn't the first argument that the appellants tried to use in this case to, to get out of their contractual obligations. What they did first is they pulled my clients into this case, Mary, Mary Duncan and John Duncan. Uh, uh, Mr. Duncan, 75, Mary Duncan has, has since passed away, and they filed all sorts of third-party claims against them for violations of the Anti-Cyber Squatting Act. Seven claims. They didn't have any evidence, so under threat of sanctions, they withdrew those claims, and it was only after that that they shifted over to their main point being, well, you didn't comply with the terms of the body contract, and even though we didn't suffer any damages, we don't have to pay you for the company that you got. I mean, this was my client's business that they started. They built up for over 30 years, and they sold in 2017. And part of the deal was they get regular monthly, regular monthly royalty payments, which they were going to use for their retirement income. And then Mr. Tierink wasn't involved in the initial deal. He took over in about 2018. And he came up with a reason because he just simply didn't want to make the payments, even though he had obtained and still uses every aspect of this company that my clients built. He got all the assets, he got all the customers, he got all the contacts, he got all the goodwill, he got the, the website, uh, he got the trademarks, he got everything with this company. The only thing so that did he, How did he obtain that? Did he buy it? 
I'm not really sure. I don't think they would tell me in discovery, but I'm assuming he, he bought the company from the, from the person who, who uh, my clients sold it to. But the reality is my clients did everything. I mean, they, they literally exit the automotive industry, the only industry that my client, Kirk Duncan, has worked in for his entire life. They weren't allowed to compete. They didn't do that. It's undisputed. They weren't allowed to solicit. They weren't allowed to interfere. They didn't do any of that. The only thing that needs to be done in order to complete this contract 100% is the royalty payments that the appellees agreed to. So we're asking this court to affirm Judge Campagnolo in all respects and to award us our attorney's fees uh, uh, expended on appeal. If the court has any questions, I'd be happy to Can answer you take them. a moment to discuss? There were, your colleague brought up issues in discovery and conflicting testimony. Can you address the issues she brought up? I, I don't agree that the testimony was conflicting and Judge Campagnolo either. I just think, I just think Mr. Leach was clarifying his testimony regarding the structure of the operations. But again, it doesn't matter because what we were relying upon is the testimony of Mr. Tiering himself who discussed what was happening and, and his intention to continue to, uh, to maintain the status quo going forward in the future. Can you also address your colleagues' challenges to the exclusivity portion of the body contract? I, I think they're in the, the same position that my clients were. I mean, think about it. If Mr. Leach was manufacturing bodies for somebody else during the time my clients owned this, there's nothing they can do about it. Mr. Leach is a person, but it, it, here nothing has changed. The issue in the body contract says that Peregrine cannot manufacture bodies for anybody else. And as Judge Campagnolo correctly determined, Peregrine is not manufacturing bodies uh, for anybody else. But again, there needs to be some sort of damages, otherwise you have an immaterial breach. There isn't a shred of damages uh, presented in the record before you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank you, it. Counsel. Thank you. To answer your earlier question about where it is in the testimony that he's making that Leach's company is producing Speedster bodies for other customers worldwide, um, his transcript is in Index of Record 83. And on the transcript in pages 16, basically 16 through 19, but I can cite specific portions. In there, he talks about um, having his own molds that he uses that are down at that facility to produce Speedster bodies, which he sells on the open market, which was consistent with the buyer's testimony that now he's just, his money's as good as anybody else's on the street when he goes to get his bodies manufactured there. And he's got to wait however long you know, his new manufacturer says it's going to take. Are the, speed, the molds different than under the original uh, contract? Are they, it, are, are they indistinguishable? I mean, I'm no expert in that, and I don't have testimony to the, you know, maybe slight variations between them, but it's, it's basically a mold for a body of the same vehicle. So it's still a Speedster body. Okay. So if we accepted your <coughs> arguments as presented, what damages have your clients suffered? Um, they had to go seek out this new manufacturer. They pay 25% more per body. Did They're they not have to seeking seek out? They're not seeking damages on, on their claims. They're merely defending the claim that they breached the asset purchase agreement by stopping the royalty payments. So the royalty payments are your client's damages? The obligation no. to continue paying them? Uh, the, royal, the obligation to continue paying royalties are the, the seller's, the appellee's damages. No, that's your client's obligation under the contract correct. is to continue to make those royalty payments. As long as the body contract's in full force and effect, correct. Okay. Um, as to the argument, again, of, of what it lost, uh, yes, he's the, my client has been able to find a new manufacturer, but that doesn't mean another contract is still in place, and he does pay more and have completely different terms with this new manufacturer. And the plain language of the asset purchase agreement says if for any reason that contract isn't in effect, that those royalty payments stop. So the royalty payments weren't guaranteed going forward. It said that 
they have to have this agreement for up to two years. Otherwise, no more royalty payments. Um, and then as to the waiver argument, uh, again, waiver can't occur when one party is a stranger to the contract. So my client can't have waived terms of a contract when the other party doesn't isn't a party to that contract or doesn't even know the terms of that contract. So they, it, there can't be a situation of waiver of the body contract terms where the, he's not in privity with this other party under that contract. When I look at the body contract, it's two molds to make specific body styles in exchange for royalty payments to the seller. That's the way I'm looking at it. If I'm looking at it that way, what has changed? I think you maybe mean the asset purchase agreement because the body contract is the one between the manufacturer. I, I, I so, get that, but basically that was what was bargained for. What was bargained for was the exclusive right to those, so no competition and the same pricing, roughly 4000 per body. Now my client has gone out and found another manufacturer but is, you know, facing competition from everyone who's able to access those speedster bodies from there. So it doesn't enjoy the exclusivity and it's paying 25% more. But wait for a minute. Sure. Do you have any evidence that the two body molds that were discussed in the purchase and the body contract are being used for anybody else? No, because that wasn't the issue. The it's undisputed that the buyer owns the two molds. The buyer could take those two molds, put them on a truck, and take them to any manufacturer, and our argument would be the same, that the body contract is no longer in full force and effect because now he's got to go compete out on the open market with other people. He doesn't have the benefit of the body contract's exclusivity with the old manufacturer who was producing, uh, according to my client's testimony, very high-quality products. And now he's having to work with a new manufacturer. Yes, he didn't pick up his molds and ship them somewhere else, but the result would be the same. No manufacturer could take the personal property of the party seeking to have something produced off of their molds and use it for other parties without risk of being sued. So, so your, your client has gotten new molds from, from from another manufacturer? No, they haven't. They own the, the two molds that were transferred to them under the asset purchase agreement. My argument is that that's my client's personal property, just like anyone seeking manufacturing might own their molds, and they can transfer those to any manufacturer. Um, so the argument isn't the molds aren't being used to produce for other people. The The argument is that they're producing speedster bodies out of that same facility for other people, so the exclusivity benefit is gone. Were they not? That's, that's You're right. fine. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Am I able to just point out uh, index of record 69 quickly on your discovery question? We will take it of note, and I'm going okay. to go through the record again. So I appreciate your arguments, counsel. We will take this matter under advisement and issue a written ruling in due course. We are at recess. Thank you.